Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us um, in our session this morning. We are excited to have Eric Prochaska from Mount Hood Community College presenting with us. Eric has taught English for over 10 years, and he's currently an instructional designer at MHCC. Um, before I turn the mic over to Eric, I just wanted to quickly mention a couple of things. The first thing is that you are all muted during the presentation, but we do have Q&A and chat enabled. So if you have any questions or comments at any point, please feel free to share. And we have um, Belda Arnold and GZ from the board helping with um, monitoring both areas today. Um, the second thing is that we don't have closed captioning at our live event, but closed captioning will be added in post-production. Okay, Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so um, the topic what I'm talking about today is uh, at Mount Hood Community College, we went from a front-loading model of training online, new online faculty to more of a just-in-time model. And I'm just going to explain uh, the process we went through, the decisions we made, and uh, hopefully something that you can take out of this all. So I am uh, an instructional designer. I've been with Mount Hood for about four years now. And at my previous school, I'm gonna share a little story uh, first. At my previous school, we went to a conference, national conference, and we attended a session that we thought was gonna help us because we were facing a problem trying to get buy-in from faculty as we tried to get more quality in our online courses. And so this session sort of promised to answer the challenge that we uh, found before ourselves. The session was great, very well attended, had super ideas. And I mean, the attendees were just, just waiting for the Q&A. And the very first question that came up was, how did you get your faculty to do all of these things? Because the faculty at that school were very engaged and they were be, uh, being paid a stipend, like a very small stipend of just a few hundred dollars, for example, to review somebody's online course, um, or it might have been to do a couple of online courses. And I actually knew the answer to that question because I was familiar with the school. I had been at that school for an interview before, and the school was in Texas. And so the answer was, there were two very important parts of the answer. One is that it's in Texas, which is a right to work state, and the uh, school had most of the leverage in terms of getting faculty to do what they wanted. And then the second aspect with that particular school was their online learning had its own campus. So if you were an English instructor and you taught English classes, that wouldn't automatically mean that you could teach for the online learning department. You'd have to go through their training. And I think actually most of the instructors in the online department were not teaching in other departments on the campus. So it was its own entity. And when those answers came out, I think most of the people in the room just kind of the wind got taken out of their sails because here were all these great ideas and they were wondering how they're going to put those into practice at their school. And ultimately, they might have decided that they couldn't. And the big lesson that I took out of that and that I, I think is kind of the, the uh, theme for my presentation today is context. You know, you have to know here in school, your faculty, the atmosphere, the culture, your department, your your budget, your limitations, your capabilities. So everything I share today is what we went through. And definitely, I think there's something in here for everybody who's interested in, in approaching their own training revamp. But again, it's not like we're handing out a formula for here's how we did it, so do it this way. And one other thing I should probably say is, of course, I'm doing a lot of criticism or I'm, I'm going to focus on the things that we did criticize. And I hate that it's going to sound a little bit negative, but um, it's just that we focused on those things uh, because we knew those are the things we needed to change. And finally, you're going to see a lot of uh, pictures of board games. Uh, they might be non sequitur or maybe it's something that'll help you sort of remember the concept that I'm going over at that point. So at Mount Hood Community College, the old system was something we called the faculty academy and we had one faculty trainer and we had one instructional designer then i came on in 2000 uh, late 2016 as the second instructional designer online teaching is an optional thing uh, you choose whether or not you want to offer an online class i don't think there's much pressure put on anybody to do that they're not contractually in fact they're not contractually obligated to do it 
We're a Blackboard school, and we are um, a little bit unique in that within Blackboard, we have created a, an HTML template, so lesson pages that uh, are used to provide a framework of accessibility and UDL for the structure of a lesson. And faculty edit those pages using a what you see is what you get online editor. So a lot like using a word processor, for example. So <clears throat> the academy lasted one term, and for us a term is 10 weeks. We have four terms through the year. Um, and it was very much a front-loaded system. We had a course inside of Blackboard that had the information in it, and faculty would proceed through the course. They, anybody in the academy would be simultaneously uh, taking a course and building a course. And when I arrived, it seemed that we had around two or three participants at a time. I'm not sure if that was historically the case, um, but, but I did arrive again in, I started in 2017 working with uh, faculty in the academy. And my director made it clear she wanted me to go through the academy model with some faculty. Um, the department already knew they wanted to change, but she wanted me to get that experience in that model so that I'd understand where the conversations were starting from. Um, and one really key thing about the academy model is that faculty can enroll anytime they wanted to. So some faculty would enroll in the academy just because they were curious about what an online class was going to be like. Some would enroll during a sabbatical as a sabbatical project. Um, and this, uh, I think we'll see, was one of the, maybe one of the main factors that would cause some problems, that people didn't necessarily have an upcoming uh, online course that they were preparing for. <clears throat> so again, with the, the one instructional designer and the, and the, or the two instructional designers and the one trainer, that trainer was responsible for hosting the LMS-based course and the instructional designers met with the faculty to build the course based on what they had learned in the Faculty Academy uh, course in Blackboard. So the instructional designer and the trainer were basically taking turns every week with the faculty member. And there was a lot of, um, of course, a lot of, a lot of scheduling, a lot of uh, uh, moving parts, as it were, that had to be coordinated. But one, like overall criticism of the process uh, that came out as we were talking about what we thought needed to be changed, what was working, what wasn't working, was that that process was separating theory and practice for a lot of people. So they would get theory in the Faculty Academy coursework, but they would do the practical things inside of their course, and those two things wouldn't always match up. Um, another kind of standout maybe problem was that exceptions kept being made on a case-by-case -case basis. So if the faculty trainer knew that so-and-so wasn't going to use quizzes in their class, uh, she could just um, release the next content to them without them having to do the content on quizzes. But if she didn't know that somebody wasn't using quizzes, then she might not give the same treatment to them. So the cases being, the uh, exceptions being made on a case-by-case -case basis seemed to be indicative, seemed to be a clue that something needed to be adjusted. So in overall characteristics, what the old system was, was everybody started and finished at the same time in that 10 week period. And it felt like a one size fits all with the scope and sequence predetermined and theoretical. So for example, <clears throat> in one module about assessments, faculty might learn about using the test tool in Blackboard. Um, they might learn about using the assignment tool in Blackboard and they might learn about grading work. And there might be some information about blogs and journals and wikis but what if there was an instructor who wanted to base their course on a wiki? There just wasn't that much information in there for that person. So that was definitely a problem. Faculty looking for what they wanted to use in their course and not necessarily feeling that attention was being paid to those specific things. So the academy wasn't just sequential <clears throat> but it also had uh, release dates and adaptive release conditions that would open or keep closed 
uh, upcoming content. So it was a series, I think, of four modules over the 10 weeks. Uh, pretty generous timeframes to get through one module. But with the opening days, due dates, adaptive release conditions, I think those were all set in place partly to model and to demonstrate how the LMS tools worked and to give instructors that, that student experience so they would you know, understand that side of the coin when they design their own class. But I think it was also there partly to keep everyone on pace. But I think that element of trying to keep everyone on pace, it was meant not to slow anybody down, but to keep anybody from falling behind. But it seems like, in some cases at least, it had the opposite effect. It just would frustrate people who were motivated to move ahead. And those who wanted to skip topics, skip into topics that they're interested in were frustrated by being held back. And then people uh, who didn't meet the conditions, uh, it, it just felt like they were jumping through hoops. So the best of intentions, but ultimately it just wasn't working out. It's causing probably more problems than it was solving. So this is a, a page from our Faculty Academy class. So it's, HTML, it's an HTML page. Um, and some of the issues that I was talking about before were made worse just by some of the things that were being done inside of the course itself. So remember, faculty were students in this course, the Faculty Academy, but they were instructors inside of a different course shell, the course that they were building. So they were basically learning two interfaces at once, caused a lot of confusion. Uh, people looking, <clears throat> for example, in this course shell, looking for ways to move content around. Or another thing being that in their own course shell, they were looking for ways to do what was done here in the Faculty Academy. So this doesn't look like the courses that people were building. This is a, a very jazzed up bells and whistles sort of a page. Um, the slider on the right, it's outlined in that pink tri uh, <laughs> pink rectangle. It's kind of the dark gray area. That slider would be triggered by a hyperlink on the page. And then it would just animate it. It would slide out from the right side of the page. And it had a lot of content. Some of these sliders had maybe two or three pages, printed pages worth of content in them. And each uh, faculty academy lesson page could have one or three maybe even, I think the most was on one page was five sliders. So we were showing faculty this product that they weren't going to be able to make. That was another source of frustration. And it also made it so that, speaking of controlling the access to knowledge or to this information, when they would go back and look for something that they were sure that they had read somewhere, they couldn't just do a simple search on a page and find the information. They'd have to open sliders, look inside of sliders. Um, it was, again, it, it's, a, it's a nice looking page, but it was probably causing more trouble than it was worth. And ultimately, I think it probably also sent the message that we thought appearance maybe was a priority. So, We've got all these things, um, and again, and again, I'm, I'm painting pretty ugly picture. I'm, I'm just focusing on the negatives. It's not like this was a disaster. It worked well for many people, but for the people it didn't work well for, we were trying to isolate these things that were uh, causing the friction and getting in their way. So when I'm talking about strict guidelines here, I think it's more the way it was interpreted than the way it was intended. But again, we've got this organized, uh, content organized in a standardized way, a very formal manner. And for any faculty who wanted to quote uh, color outside the lines, there was this matter of differing expectations. So the, the trainer was trying to keep them on the straight and narrow for the content that they were learning in the faculty academy, because that was all prepackaged. Then when they would speak with the instructional designer, the instructional designer might be willing to talk about those different ideas so they're getting, now they're starting to get mixed messages as well. If someone would fall behind in their work, um, forget to submit a quiz or participate in a discussion, then they might get an email from the trainer. And of course that was intended to keep them on pace, intended in a very positive manner. But I think it also could come across as kind of a nag email to some people. And you just get this, uh, sometimes a spiraling 
uh, negative relationship happening. Um, I think from my time working in the old system, it felt like we weren't always focused enough on building their course, but our attention got diverted to managing their time. And anytime a professional is put in a situation where a peer is parenting them, you know, it's not too unlikely that this harsh vibe is going to happen. So now we've got the flow of knowledge being controlled, the scope and sequence not matching the perceived needs and wants, and we've got the autonomous streak that faculty and probably most instructional designers share uh, working against us in some cases. So it's no surprise we have people who would just go AWOL. They would stop participating in the academy class. They might even stop meeting with the instructional designer. And they would, in some cases, they would just stop working altogether. But in some cases, they would keep working on their class, but kind of in their private laboratory, just on their own. They wouldn't respond to emails. They wouldn't show up for meetings. But when they were done, or at the end of the 10 weeks, they would show up and show us what they had done. Um, that obviously was precluding the conversations and, and the training element that was intended from the get-go. So it wasn't working out. Even if somebody did come in with a pretty decent class, then we wouldn't know how they arrived at that class. And this, um, this faculty academy, the point of it was not just to build one class, but to equip the faculty to build and teach quality online courses going forward. So not knowing how they had gotten that product was still kind of a problem. And sometimes we could just talk with them and find out uh, what they had learned and everything. But again, it was a, it was a real monkey wrench there. So <clears throat> one other uh, thing to point out here is that if there is a faculty member who was already teaching in Blackboard or another LMS at a different school, even if they're teaching the same course that they're going to teach at Mount Hood, we did not allow them just to bring the course over to copy the course and then begin teaching it. They were still required contractually to go through our training. So again, um, you can see where that, obviously that still is a point of frustration for some people, but I think under the old system, even worse, because I think that they didn't, definitely didn't see the value in going through the academy part. And they felt that their class was already built. So why would they build another class? And again, a lot of people just kind of in that DIY mentality there. So now we've got people, expectations not being met, don't see the value in the training, trying to build the course on their own. And remember, they might be doing this even though they don't even have an online course being offered in the near future or at all. So they might be doing this just out of curiosity uh, for whatever reason. So it's not surprising at this point, people might just stop out. They might drop out altogether. We saw just in the time that I was in the old system, which was less than a year, definitely saw a lot of dropouts and then return customers. Basically, they might get three weeks or five weeks into the process, feel that they weren't quite getting it or weren't going to have a course built within 10 weeks. Then they'd stop. They'd schedule to start up again in the next term. And so it was, uh, it was um, not efficient, basically. I had, I know in my first six months, I had at least three people who were going through that kind of a, and two of them three times. So for 30 weeks, basically, I was meeting with the same people and we just weren't making any progress. And in, I think, at least two of those cases, I don't think the courses are finished. So it's not surprising you get this, this uh, cluster of frustration, this feeling you're wasting your time. You start to expect the worst when you see these same people come through the door again. So again, all of these uh, negative things that we found, they just keep accumulating and building up. <clears throat> and ultimately, we're, we're not offering the courses that we want to be offering, and people aren't getting the training that we want them to be getting. So we knew we had to change. So we get to a turning point. And again, really my director knew we were already at the turning point. Um, we kept using the old system for months um, as we were having these conversations. We didn't just flip a switch and switch to a new system. But we were, we were having weekly conversations at a minimum about what could a better system look like. So obviously we have um, these three professionals in the room, the trainer and the two IDs, as well as our director, our support specialist. 
And we've all got experience with what is working and what isn't working in the current system. We've tried things in the past as trainers at different schools or as instructors in different classes. We've had experience as learners, we've read articles, we've gone to conferences, we've got a lot of ideas. And then how do we sort through those ideas? How do we bring all of those up? I say one thing is, I don't, I don't know if we ever had uh, one idea that was simply like a system. We'll just take this existing system and impose it on our system. I don't think we ever thought that that was going to work. I think we always knew that our situation was specific. And so we had to probably custom make something that was gonna work for ourselves. So we're looking what's gonna work, what elements are gonna work individually, but of course, more importantly, what's going to work synergistically. So we brought up a lot of ideas. We shot down a lot of ideas. Um, in, in terms of that individual versus synergistic, one of the ideas that I remember coming up was to still have a faculty uh, discussion board so that everybody going through the training at the same time would be involved in certain discussions. But then if we were going to get rid of the old academy course, the question was, where's that discussion going to live? And if we, if we start uh, bending the rules and changing things so that that discussion can exist, how does that affect all the other things we want to do? So lots and lots of meetings, lots and lots of ideas coming and going. What we did know for certain that we wanted were two things. We wanted a more flexible training that could adapt to any faculty member. And we wanted resources that could be as close to the point of need as possible. So we didn't want resources tucked away inside of a faculty academy course shell anymore. We wanted them where faculty could access them at, at, their, at convenient times. Some of the ideas we thought about, um, we thought about having cohorts. And I'm just gonna shoot a few of these down because it just made sense. To, it, it, it helped us define who we were as a department, who we were as a school, and, and some of the great ideas that we might hear from from other schools and to apply those pull those up to our school and say, will this work, will this won't work? So cohorts, we immediately saw we probably would have scheduling problems. And that was based on our experience with people skipping meetings or missing meetings in the past. And admit actually at this point in time, if we talked about doing cohorts again, we might do it. But back then we just didn't think it would work. But we talked about having three milestones throughout the 10 weeks. And at those three milestones, the instructional designers and each of their uh, faculty members would come in into the room together, into a, a conference room together, peer review what had been done, brainstorm some new ideas. But again, we were just really worried about uh, people not keeping up. And then if they didn't keep up, if they were holding back somebody else who was doing well. We thought about having a dedicated instructional designer for each department on campus. Um, the first argument against that was probably that some departments have tons of people come through our training and some departments have very few people and just how to juggle that and that that would flex over time didn't seem very feasible. We talked about embedding resources inside of the Blackboard course shells and we mocked up a few ways to do this. Um, we were talking about things like putting notes to instructors inside of modules links to tutorial videos inside of those modules. The problems here, um, on the surface level, I'd say the problem is that it could be still kind of clunky, kind of confusing. Ultimately, we would, we would be telling faculty to delete those things, but we wouldn't want them to delete those too soon. But I think the, the more underlying problem is that model is still task-based, it's still prescribed, it's still predetermined. And that's what we really found ourselves. We kept finding, as we tried to break away from what we had been doing, we were really you know, tethered in it. And I don't know if we were just familiar with it. Um, we kept talking about doing something different and yes, it seemed like it kept circling back to what we were already doing. <clears throat> One final idea we had was um, using project management tools to loop in the deans, to manage appointments, track progress. Again, this ended up still being focused on uh, tasks and management probably would have uh, backfired, I would guess. So we shot down a lot of ideas, but it helped us contextualize what we needed for our situation. So the ideas are developing, the wheels are turning, we're coming up with some good suggestions, but 
We've also got reality that sometimes got in the way. Our school has a pretty strong faculty contract and some of the details of our training are already put into official language. So the overall parameters, we didn't have really wiggle room to just adjust things as we saw fit. We had to make sure it matched what was already written down. Time, we could only cover so much content in the 10 week periods. Um, I used to teach at a school with 16 week semesters in a different state. The online learning department there had a semester long training, which made sense, you know, 16 weeks. And then the, the next semester you'd be teaching. They could cover a lot more content, but we were still constricted by time. Budget, uh, when we looked at things like project management tools or other software, we had to really be able to justify subscribing to a service or putting out that money. And ultimately some of those things, even if the money were there and in these times it might not be there, even if it were, we weren't sure everybody in the department was going to use that tool or if everybody was on board. And so those got written off. We had the limitations of the LMS. It couldn't function like a project manager, which is, you know, basically what we were trying to make it do in some sense. And we just thankfully finally gave up on trying to make that happen. And finally, uh, one of the big things also is other stakeholders. We had to get approval for campus organizations, faculty organizations to have a training that they would approve of. So it really couldn't be something that went too far out there and we would lose our audience. <clears throat> so as we knew we wanted to get away from the one size fits all sequence and that we needed a built-in device that can inform a successful course build, probably the two most important things we came up with were a blog, I'm gonna talk more about that, and online learning certification competencies. So the competencies, I'll show you in a second, these became a guiding document, basically addressing that question of what can we teach in these 10 weeks? What's this minimum threshold that makes a good online course, but also a good on, online instructor? So it's, it's, it's become integral, uh, uh, crucial to be able to guide us as we go through a non-structured training environment. And the blog basically addresses our concern for wanting to have resources at the point of need, whenever, wherever faculty want to get to them, not arranged by us or sequenced by us, but searchable with the ability to cross-reference. Um, a blog just, uh, when, when somebody said that out loud, that was just a breakthrough moment. So now we've got the new approach. We've been using this approach for the last um, almost three years, basically three years. I'd say the first six months, maybe even the first year of it, there were a lot of um, adjustments being made in the last two years has been pretty consistent. Um, but as I mentioned, the online certification competencies, these cover uh, six categories, institutional context, technologies, et cetera. And basically, this is what it looks like. This is a snippet from one page of it. The competencies are a guiding document. We don't use them as um, necessarily a checklist. We don't hold, I, I know, I, I don't put this on a clipboard and hold it up to somebody and start going down the list at the end of a course build. Uh, but I do do that on my side of things, um, not necessarily with the instructor. I do um, make sure we're addressing all the areas that need to be addressed. So this was, I'd say this was definitely a concern when we were building this document. We were worried, is it going to be used as a stick to force people to address all these concerns? Or how do we motivate them to, to build a quality course? And how do you uh, introduce this document without it seeming like, um, like you're an authority? And so, Personally, I prefer just to monitor the progress when I'm building a course with somebody. There is still, while it's not structured the same way it used to be, there's still a very natural progression, at least for the first few weeks and maybe the last few weeks. And we just have more, a much more organic uh, conversation as we build the course. And I should also point out, this is not used as a rubric for assessing any courses. I'd say it's more like a list of ingredients from a recipe. The new approach also was accompanied by changes to our department. We do not have a faculty trainer anymore. We now have 
three instructional designers. The faculty trainer um, attended a program in instructional design and she her job description has changed now so we all have the same job description basically. So that immediately meant <clears throat> And there wasn't going to be any more bouncing off of two people, the trainer and the instructional designer. Faculty just work with one instructional designer, develop a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's very streamlined. No more need for a trainer and an instructional designer to coordinate their efforts around the single faculty member. And down at the bottom last item on this slide, this is, it's kind of a hidden aspect, it's, but it's, it's so crucial. Our director has a very um, formal sit down onboarding process with any new faculty and expectations are made very clear. Signatures are provided on some documents. The dean is always looped in. And this to me has, uh, it's been just as important as the way that we organize the materials and as that guiding document in the last two years, I think we've had virtually nobody miss a meeting, at least not without prior notice and not without rescheduling. Um, it's, it's funny because I, we don't know if it just took somebody with the authority of a director to say certain things or that signature, what it was exactly. The faculty just, um, they treat the training very, very differently now. And definitely having people not miss meetings is very helpful. The new system, the core topics are covered when they're appropriate, when we, when we reach that point in a conversation with somebody in their course build, but we don't have a formal course with a scope and sequence the way that we used to. Again, we just use the competencies and our own knowledge and our own professional uh, pro professionalism to guide them through their course build. And other topics come up uh, naturally as well. For example, when I start talking with somebody about building a course in our template pages, I'm going to show them the course shell, show them the template pages, and I always explain how that template page works in terms of accessibility and universal design. Then once that faculty member starts editing those pages again, and I'm showing them how to edit those pages, I remind them to keep the headings in place, to use lists, um, to keep their colors accessible so that conversation comes up again when they've edited some lesson pages and made some pages in their course and we're reviewing them together again that conversation just keeps coming up so instead of just putting it out there in a chapter of a book it's revisited oh probably almost every week in some cases so there's no more formal course there's no more quote unquote homework no more tasks no more hoops to jump through everything that we ask instructors to do occurs inside of their course that they're building and it directly affects the quality of their course so it's very obvious to them it's practical and it's being applied we have agreements that any instructor who enrolls in the certification will be offered that course online the following term and we now require the deans to approve of the people who enroll in the training so you put all that together and it makes the training very relevant and very urgent for people. This is a, um, a mashup of a couple of screenshots. The larger image is the homepage of our blog and the inset image is from our Blackboard. So we decided not to try to put the resources actually inside of course shells. We thought that would muck things up, just cause more problems than it was worth. Our solution, was to put a link to the faculty resources blog in the top tab of Blackboard. So no matter where you are when you're in Blackboard, you're just a click away from getting to the blog. <clears throat> then on the blog itself, um, I'm sorry, I just, I just always call it the blog, on our faculty resources site itself, we tried to design it so that people could find things in ways that are natural to them. Uh, what I mean here is that at the top center, there's a search form and the search form probably gets used, I would assume more than anything else. In the middle of the page where the Blackboard icon is and the course setup is, we've got some clusters of topics that we've hand curated to put out there, things that we know people have been looking for and asking for. 
So that home page is uh, sort of manually set up. And then over on the right, it says search by topic and there's a drop down category uh, menu. The categories align directly with the topics from the certification competencies. So they can search in a way that's uh, so somewhat connected to that guiding document. And then the tags, the tag cloud on the right um, has also proven to be very, very well used. And we've actually developed a, kind of a new thing recently. We've got a couple of them deployed. It's what we're calling our launch page. So we have some topics like Zoom, um, Kaltura, things like that, that have sometimes maybe a couple of dozen topics related to them. And people new to those technologies might come into the search bar and just type in Kaltura. They get a couple dozen results, not maybe arranged in the most helpful manner. So the launch page clusters topics under subcategories, like getting started with Zoom, um, adding Zoom content to your course, things like that. So this landing page, this homepage probably will be replaced by something else once more of those launch pages are up and running. And then this is a, an example of one of the posts on the blog. Looks very much like the landing page, of course. Um, you have the title of the article, the writing effective online discussion questions. And just above that, it says social presence. That is a link to the social presence uh, category or tag, or tag rather. So you can find other topics related to that. Then there is a table of contents that expands. It says what's on this page. And then down at the bottom of each page, there is a related post area. Um, this is a plugin, or this, this might be inherent in the, it's a WordPress blog that we're using. And we can manually add things on a post by post basis. So if we know that we want people to be paying attention to the grading online discussions topic, we could put that to be the first related post under any topic that is related to discussions, for example. Down below that, there are some colorful icons where you can email this topic, print this topic, share it on different media, different ways. Below that, it says explore topics tagged, similar to this one. And that has then the tags that were attached to this topic. These are all links that, for example, if you click on instructor presence, then you'll get a listing of all the, the um, posts in the blog that are tagged instructor presence. So just a lot of pathways for people to be able to explore things and hopefully to discover new topics they might not have even known that they were looking for. <clears throat> so back to the board games, our, uh, our new approach. It's definitely allowed more time for conversations about the class and how it can be taught. It allows for faculty to see, to, to ease through what I call the paradigm shift from teaching face-to-face -to, -face to teaching online and lets us focus on whatever faculty wants to focus on first. So we still have that common finish line. We still start and stop in these 10 week intervals. But what happens in between there is very, very individualized, always individualized to every instructor. I don't think we've ever had the same you know, exact path twice. I don't know that we ever would. And again, there would be some worry early on that we would miss things, but um, we have again, the certification competencies. So we have that guiding document to remind us of anything that hasn't come up organically that we can make sure to bring it up in a meeting. But there just seems to be always a conversation to be had about these broader topics when we're working on the detailed elements. And we always get around to building a fully developed course guided by those competencies. And using the blog, we can send out whatever topics we think somebody needs at a given time directly to their inbox. One really interesting uh, result of the new approach, I think, has been cooperation. Once we got freed from the structure of the faculty academy, I think the instructional designers, again, we were able to focus on more specific course activities, more creative solutions. And then, of course, we get excited about what we come up with and we share it with the team and we see how we can uh, introduce that to somebody, so another faculty member who has a similar uh, activity or uh, problem in their course. <clears throat> this could be something like using Flipgrid in place of a discussion for a particular reason. 
or using uh, lately actually some people have been using the blackboard uh, blog tool for discussions instead of using the discussion board uh, because of its similarity the blog tool similarity to social media and it seems to have provoked more discussion with their students so a lot more sharing going on and i feel that, that gives faculty more creative license and ownership faculty feel more invited to bring in ideas and tech that they've heard about because we're not just dictating to them this process and the tools that they have to use. So the last couple of years, um, this might be overly optimistic, but yes, more successes in a certain sense, no one loses um, and everyone enjoys the process maybe. Um, again, we have, I, I don't think I've had anybody stop out or drop out for two years, over two years. The only person that I can think of, they had a medical emergency in the family and stopped maybe five or six weeks into the process and then immediately picked up in the next term and finished the course. And it was an amazing course, it turned out to be a great, great course, one of my favorite courses ever. Um, but we're avoiding that, that cycle of those negative emotions and, and negative reactions to people who uh, come back through our door like a revolving door. We've just gotten rid of that dimension entirely. The training is, as I said, I think earlier, relevant and urgent to everyone because they're gonna be teaching this course just a couple of weeks after they finish building it. Their courses, everything that they do in those courses is very concrete, very specific to them. It's not theoretical anymore. Um, for me, one of the, the successes here would be our music department. I, I don't think that we had any music classes online as of a couple of years ago. And the first music class that I built was actually beginning guitar, not the first one that I thought I would build. Uh, did beginning guitar and then music appreciation. So it went from one faculty member a few months later, the next one, a few months later, the next one, and just finished up with the fourth one in the last, I think two years, about every six months, somebody's come through and they've all asked uh, to work with me. I think that's great. Um, I, all of our instructional designers are great. But it just says, you know, they're having a good experience. They recommend that experience to somebody else. So it's really rewarding and tells us we're doing something right. Uh, the medical office and billing program would be another department that um, I'd say in my first year here, we, we saw a lot of people try to get into Blackboard. They knew that they wanted to offer the courses online. Uh, we had a lot of adjunct faculty and there were some other situations that just, it was difficult for them with time management and stuff, trying to get out to our campus do the the training uh, with the new system we've had i want to say a good half dozen people in the last two years through those departments get online so it's been a really real success story for them ah, challenges we've got high hopes uh <laughs> my team we've we've got very very broad visions about what we'd like to be able to accomplish sometimes and um like the blog itself we've got topics in there that go far beyond building your first online course. And of course, the audience for the blog isn't just our uh, new faculty, new to online learning. It's for all of our faculty who teach online and really for all of our faculty in a sense. And um, we're finding ways we, we can track what people do search for or how many, um, how many visits different topics have, things like that through analytics. And we can just see you know, certain topics we wish we could get out in front of people more. Maybe people aren't digging deep enough, diving deep enough into the blog to get to those topics. So there's still a challenge of how to get certain uh, topics out in front of people. And even um, we've had a lot of praise for the blog. Um, some people just love it, it's revolutionary to them. Uh, we've had uh, literally somebody said, I don't like to read and uh, please make us videos or please Zoom whenever I have a question. And that's fine, not everybody uses the blog. Um, not everybody uses it to the same degree, but for us, it's been largely successful. It takes a lot of work off of our shoulders. Uh, in fact, we, on a side note, we've also created a student support blog. So uh, totally separate space, different look to it, but it answers a lot of common questions that students have that takes a lot of the work off of the uh, phone lines and off of our support specialist. Lessons learned. Um, bells and whistles. <laughs> Bells and whistles slow down a blog is one lesson learned. Uh, we had a lot of add-ons in the blog months ago and when, really it was when uh, this, back in March, when this COVID situation struck, I could show you analytics, our, our usage went uh, skyrocketed um, 20 to 40 times the usage in a single day. 
And that started showing us that with that much usage, our blog was a little sluggish. When we started taking things out, we could identify whether or not people were using those tools. Uh, took them out, sped things up, and um, the streamlined model is definitely working better for us. And speaking of COVID, the blog, I'd say both the blog and the competencies, but definitely the blog made it uh, much easier for our department to move to a remote training situation than it would have been two years before. Uh, if we had gone that route two years before, we did have a lot of documents like in PDF form or something, but it's just, it's not quite the same thing to have all those in a file cabinet and you can send people what they ask for as opposed to letting people roam free in that library of resources that you have. And one challenge that comes up, I'd say with maybe with COVID or uh, anything else, uh, for example, I was, I was just reminded at the beginning of this session that when we all jumped on Zoom back in the spring, Zoom, I believe our Zoom crashed a few times and I know Zoom made updates quickly, for example, with their security to avoid Zoom bombing and some of the recommendations for security were updated. Well, we had already made, I don't know, a dozen topics in our blog about Zoom. So when something like that happens, we do have to get in there and try to get rid of the old information, replace it with the new information as quickly as possible. And if you don't, then you definitely hear from people letting you know you've got contradictory information or old information in there. So that's is a little bit of a challenge to keep up that when we're awfully busy. And what next? Um, our school's still got a lot of things in the works now. Um, our evolution is not over. We've got uh, plans for continued improvement in quality for online instruction and courses. And I feel like these are going to be able to be integrated really, really well with our existing uh, system. It's going to be nice to think that we don't have to throw out what we've got to accommodate the next change, whether that's uh, faculty peer review, whatever it is that our current system is now going to be able to work moving forward with those things. And that's all I've got for you. So I'm going to turn it back over. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, we do have some questions for you. Are you ready for the questions? I am ready. <laughs> um, Velda, would you like to call out some questions? Sure, I can do that. So we have from Ray, with the old system, how often and what were the communication slash meeting methods between faculty and instructional designers, trainers? and how often did they check in or consult? Yeah, it was supposed to be a weekly meeting with the instructional designer, and then I think with the trainer, it was mostly done through email um, as things progressed. But of course, if, if things weren't progressing, then the trainer might also ask face-to-face -face or might request to be in on the face-to-face -face that the ID already had scheduled. So like on paper, it's not a very complicated system, but in practice, it, it just turned into a kind of a mess sometimes and i'd say we still we have the same requirement now it's a weekly meeting once a week for one either 60 or 90 minutes i'm using nine minute 90 minute slots with my people um and nobody has complained about 90 minutes uh, once a week and um again this time there's no trainer looped in but um so that that requirement really hasn't changed okay thank you um, another question from Ray. Um, no, that's the same question. Uh, with the new system, do you provide faculty with custom individualized digital teaching resources, i.e. special topic websites and or LMS based resources? Yeah, definitely uh, the first. Um, if there's a resource that we know of, for example, that we don't have some sort of a write-up in it in the blog, yeah, of course, we'll send them the link or we'll demonstrate something for them, whether it's a software, whether it's a website that will help their students, a tool that will help them. Um, and then for the second, um, we didn't, we definitely do some customization inside of course shells. Um, I do some work like some CSS, some, some style work. For example, with a hybrid course, if the, um, the, the, the lesson uh, overview page has the activities that should be done before the face-to-face -face meeting, so the online component, and then if it also maybe has some mention of what's going to happen in the face-to-face -face meetings, 
I've got a just kind of some simple code that puts a, a colorful bubble, very, you know, a, a faint bubble background around the one cluster of topics and then another one around the other cluster just to make sure students can keep those separate. So we do a lot of like custom work there in the HTML. And that's sometimes the fun, the fun part of a course build. I would think it would be fun. Okay, another question from DW. Why did you choose a blog versus a knowledge base? Um, gee, that might be a good question. <laughs> I, I can't remember off the top of my head going back. Um, but, but wait, I think I do know. Our student blog actually is a knowledge base. And so with our knowledge base, we've got a much more, it's much more linear. It's not totally linear. You can search for things, of course, but um, in the knowledge base, topics are grouped under, uh, there's categories, topics, subtopics, et cetera. So it's a, a more of a organized method. With the blog, it's really only organized by how things are related to each other. So how they're tagged, what category they belong to. And you can click on a category and see the contents of a category. But when you do click in the category to see those contents, they're just arranged chronologically. They're not arranged. Um, it's, I'd say with the blog, we were hoping really that, uh, for one thing, that we wouldn't limit the way that people found things. And then we were also hoping that people then would stumble upon a lot of the topics. So some of that's happening. That, that would be one area where I wish it was happening more, but I think people take what they need and don't spend a whole lot of time in there reading every other little thing that we've written up. <laughs> that would be weird. <laughs> so a question from Paul. Do you have tips on gaining management buy-in for the blog? Management buy-in for the blog? Yeah, it's $100 a year, man. Um, I'll, so I, I've, I've done a few WordPress blogs before over the years, and so this was um, something that I took on. And I think I actually, I had a site that I had hosted, and I went ahead and installed a blog and mocked up some stuff before I showed it to the team. Um, and it was, you know, those, I think, first questions were basically what's it going to cost and it was you know pretty much the cost of hosting wordpress itself we aren't paying for any plugins we've got a couple of dozen plugins really very useful plugins we haven't had to pay for any uh, outside coding at all we do that a uh, little customization to it by ourselves uh, just customization to the visuals we haven't customized like any of the scripts so um it's really cheap for one thing, but it's so easy to, it's so easy to update topics. You know, if you've got um, any, any other method of, of having a repository of documents, you know, those physical documents, maybe get printed, get sent out, et cetera. Uh, with the blog, when we need to change um, something about Zoom's security policy, we get into that post, we change it, we update it, we clear the cache of that post. And everybody who visits that page now has the updated page. and. There's no worry that there's an old copy of it out there anymore. And it's very, it's very organic and flexible. It can grow with you, very scalable. Okay, another question from Paul. Can you subscribe to a knowledge base like you can with a blog? I think that you can. I think that would come down to uh, what service you're using and then what plugins were in there. So uh, WordPress was our choice because it just has I, I want to say tens of thousands of plugins that add different features to your blog. Um, the competitors just don't have anywhere near that kind of functionality. So for example, we had added in the past scripts like where people could bookmark pages and they could save their favorites. <coughs> That's something we took out. We found that people just weren't using it, but um, you can add feedback forms, contact forms. Um, it's pretty limitless what you can do there. So I'm sure you could add a subscription feature. Okay, thank you. So are faculty required or expected to do accessibility training? So we do a degree of accessibility training, you know, within the context of our online courses. Um, this is a conversation that comes up a lot because we do have an accessible education services <laughs> department on office department on campus, um, but that's really their wheelhouse. So for example, if I get some, when we, when we teach somebody how to edit the template, the template's basically headings, 
um, bulleted lists, nothing too terribly complicated. And so we teach them those basics to use the styles to create your headings, things like that. Uh, when it goes beyond that, when we've got like a literature professor who has 50 scanned PDFs, we might have that conversation for with them for why those need to be addressed, but then we definitely refer them to the AES. Okay. Um, in your new approach, what's your instructional designer to faculty ratio? Um, I guess I'm not sure I understand that question exactly, but instructional designer works one-on-one -on -one with every faculty member who they work with. So, well, you have um, three in, three instructional designers. How many faculty do you have? Gotcha, gotcha. Sorry, I, and I meant to cover that earlier. Right now, for example, we've got fifteen people, I believe. So five to one, one to five. Okay. So I've I basically got a, a meeting every day on Zoom with a different faculty member. Uh, one of my peers, I think, has his all scheduled like clustered together in the middle of the week on two days or something, but <laughs> it's manageable. And can I ask a follow-up question on that? Yeah. Um, now that you do have this more personal relationship with faculty, um, have you experienced any pushbacks on ideas and recommendations that you provide? And if so, how do you push that? You know, the biggest pushback, the one that comes to mind is when we're talking about RSI, regular and substantive interaction, and we get um, I don't want to sound like I'm bad mouthing our instructors or anything, but you know this this is one that it's a it's a real sticking point. You know we believe in it, and we know it's a, a federal mandate, and we also know um, there are some courses that maybe could get away without having a discussion board or or some direct student interaction. But we always try to pursue that conversation, always, always, always. So, for example, if we're in a science or a medical course and one of their early courses in their uh, program of study might be terminology. And they say, well, this is just a terminology course. They're gonna memorize it the way I memorized it and my grandmother memorized it before me and they just have this attitude of there's only one way to learn this. Um, that would be the area we get the most pushback in and we've got arguments for the interaction. And um, we, I would say, I, I'm saying always a lot. I feel like we always come up also with activities that could work for them because a traditional discussion isn't necessarily a very good activity for memorizing medical terminology. We know that, but that doesn't mean that there's no way to have student student interaction. So definitely got pushback there. Um, we, we can refer to, well, one thing we can refer to actually is the competencies. Um, that's one thing that they sign off on that they understand their course needs to live up to what's in that document. And there's a section about social presence. Uh, with the three or five um, subtopics there. So it's it's something that we can say, this is something that you agreed to do. Um, again, I, I've never actually had to pull out that document and say that. It usually comes down to some conversations. Um, and I, I'd have to admit, there's definitely some instructors who don't buy in. They might do it because we're saying they have to do it. And I can admit there's at least one case in the past few years that I know somebody um, built those interactive elements and then maybe that first term she taught or the next term immediately deleted those from her course. Um, and that's something that our department is working on as far as um, continued improvement and continued quality management that we'd be able to revisit those courses and take a second look at those at some, some point. Thank you so much. Um, I am watching the clock. We are almost at an hour. So thank you so much, Eric, for sharing your experience, expertise, and, and the stories. Um, I think this is a topic that many of us have been um, discussing within our own institutions. And what you've shared, Eric, really gives us a lot of things to think about. Um, so we are going to close the webinar now, but if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out. Um, and we look forward to seeing you, all of you attendees, um, in our future uh, sessions. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.